Okay. Welcome to our discussion between experts from Drake Software and NATP. I'm Megan Sonicson with NATP, and I have the pleasure of moderating this conversation. At NATP, we believe that all tax taxpayers should be supported by caring and well-educated tax professionals. So we're here today to have an in-depth discussion on a topic that we believe many taxpayers and tax professionals will have a difficult time with this upcoming tax season. That's the advanced child tax credit. So who better to discuss this topic? Well, I have with me two people who have been answering your calls on this topic since the passage of the American Rescue Plan. Rhonda Collins and Sherry Franze. Rhonda is our Director of Tax Content and Government Relations, and Sherry is a CPA who has been a part of the NATP Research Department for nearly 10 years. Hi, ladies. Hi, Hi. Megan. As you, the tax professional, know, once you have your answers, you need to properly report your findings to the IRS. And of course, you rely on your tax tax prep software to do this. To help us navigate through the ACTC from Drake Software, we have John Sapp, CPA, the Chief Revenue Officer at Drake, and Federal Tax Analyst, Bob Nolan. Bob is a CPA and EA who is by all accounts a tax software guru. Welcome, John and Bob. How are you? Good. Thanks for having us, Megan. We love Our doing things with the NATP. It's our pleasure. So let's get started. Sherry, can you please give us the quick need to know regarding the advance payments? Well, the advance payments, new this year, as we all know, currently the IRS has on their website 15 topics under the frequently asked questions. That's topics A through zero. And yes, I checked yesterday. Nothing new has been added since then. What's been happening this year is from July through December, six advanced Tax, um, child tax credit payments are gonna go out, which is gonna be about half of what the child, um, child tax credit should be for the taxpayers this year, all right? They're gonna range from $300 to say $250 a month. And it's gonna depend primarily on the age of the child. From ages um, six to 17, you'll get the 250, anything under the age of six, anything under, any child under the age of six is eligible for the $300 payment. Now, just one thing I do wanna mention, this year it's new, it's age 17. All years prior to 2021, it was age 16. You had to be under age 17. So this year they bumped it up a year in age, which is really helpful to the parents. And this is a one-time only thing right now, as we know it for 2021. There has been rumor that this could be extended to 2022 or even made permanent, but that's just it. It's rumor right now, nothing more than that. All right. And let's see. We also want to mention that there is a bit of a safe harbor for those that might receive child tax credits. And I think we'll probably discuss that a little later on. Sorry, I was getting ahead of myself. No, that's great, Cherry. So John, what's your biggest concern regarding the ACTC this tax season? <laughs> well, it's hard to pick a biggest concern, right? Um, as Sherry pointed out, there's a lot of complexities around it. And the, the number one thing that that we're dealing with today and trying to figure out the most efficient way to get the information to tax professionals uh, is their client recognizing that they received an advanced child tax credit and what the correct amount is. So that's probably, um, you know, without that information, they will have, you know, they won't, get, they won't get the child tax credit denied. That won't be a ramification, but huge delays in refunds are extremely likely if they don't get that number right. And then, of course, who gets the brunt of that question is the tax professional. Where's my refund? Why did you mess it up? All those types of customer service issues that the professional would have to deal with. Um, you know, the, the second piece of that, uh, Sherry was talking about, you know, taxpayers can get half of it today, but the only way that taxpayers can get the other half is to file a tax return. So now we have 
you know, I think it was um, 88% of kids in the United States are eligible to receive some advance payment that's going to have to be reconciled on a tax return or taxpayers who don't file a tax return. Maybe their income level is low or grandparents raising kids, whatever it is, they have to file a tax return now. Uh, and we dealt that we dealt with that on the RRC side, but that complexity around um, taking folks that aren't in the tax system today and helping them file their first tax return potentially in a, a some time in order to get the other half of the ACTC is also going to be a big challenge for tax professionals, I think. Yeah, and speaking of the RRC, we know that taxpayers received a letter in the mail. We anticipate that the IRS will provide taxpayers with letter 6419 that includes what they've supposedly received. But in our past experiences with these letters, sometimes the taxpayer says they didn't receive that amount or they received more than that. So I guess my next question would be to Sherry, what should tax professionals do in that situation when their clients are reporting something different than what the letter says? You have to be very careful to go against what the IRS is saying. If you're going to deviate from what the IRS is saying, you would better have that substantiation in line to support your position. If you received these deposits via direct deposit, add them up, be able to show that this is all that I received, not what you are saying I received. If by chance you received that check by mail, make sure you have those deposit slips because if you can't substantiate it, The IRS is going to go with their numbers. The burden of proof is on the taxpayer. It is not on the IRS, at least in all the cases I've read. Burden of proof is always on the taxpayer, rarely on the IRS. So they are thinking that they sent you this month much money. You had better be able to prove that that number is different. And just as a little caveat here, gang, the IRS was going to send all these checks out or these payments out, I should say in the way that you had listed on your tax return, the most recently filed one for 2020 or 2019, whichever the child tax credit is being based on. And if you had a direct deposit on there and for some reason your account changed, they were gonna start sending you paper checks, all right? So say somebody moved cross country and they had to close a bank in one place and that now the IRS starts sending paper checks, they're gonna send paper checks to your most recent address on file. That could have changed unless you sent in the letter saying I have a change of address. So these paper checks could be maybe floating around out there and the taxpayer thinks, well, I didn't receive them, but they're all outstanding checks with the IRS. So there's gonna be a lot of hoops that the taxpayers are going to have to go through to prove that they did not get these checks, all right? That's true. You know, and as John pointed out, if you, you report something other than what the IRS thinks you've got, you're going to have processing delays. You're going to be waiting on refunds. Um, the, now, the IRS does have what looks like a pretty good tool at their website. And I see somebody smarter than me seems to have, uh, have actually given us that link, which is a good thing. Um, there, there's a tool the taxpayer will be able to go to and at least verify the number the IRS has. And it may be the better part of valor, even if the taxpayer doesn't agree with that, to um, to file it that way. And if it's a significant difference, maybe go back and amend, uh, you know, to try and claim an additional amount if, if they think that they have it coming and that they can prove they have it coming. You know, that's a, that's a drastic uh, recommendation, Bob. Um, yeah. To, but I, I know we went through that same decision process last year, um, you know, with unemployment. Do you amend or do you trust the IRS to, um, you know, revise your return on the back end? And, and tax preparers are going to be faced with that same situation here. Um, do you file a return with the numbers the IRS has or do you file a return with the numbers your client's telling you? And we all have different opinions on that, I'm sure, but it's a it's a compelling uh, discussion that or situation that's going to face all tax preparers this coming season. And what if the IRS sends payments to taxpayers who shouldn't receive them? 
I know, Sherry, you briefly touched about the safe harbors. Do you want to mm -hmm. discuss that a little bit more about how that works? Sure. Let's just first of all say if you didn't, if you weren't eligible for it, there's a really good chance you're going to have to pay it back. However, and that's going to come up primarily, shall we say, in custody and divorce cases, which I know we're going to talk about in a little bit. But I just want to mention that there is a safe harbor in some cases if you receive a payment and your income is below a certain level, you, you don't have to send it back or that payment back, all right? But for example, if your, your income is below $40,000 for single folks, they can keep the money. 50,000 for head of household and then 60,000 for the married filing joint. Of course, there's a phase out range and once they hit a certain amount, then they're right back into the payback area, all right? So if you, if you receive this, you do have that safe harbor. And as you can see, the payback, the phase out is going to be 40 to 80,000 for single payers, 50 to 100,000 for the head of household, and then one, uh, 60 to 160 or 120 for the married filing joint. And anything above those numbers, that 80, 120, and the 100, your full paybacks are going to be required. So if you weren't eligible for that child tax credit, I hope taxpayers are setting it aside and it would be very wise to advise your clients ahead of time through possibly a year end newsletter and let them know about that. So Rhonda, you spend a lot of time answering questions from our members. What's the biggest question you're getting? Oh, yes, Megan, in working with our research staff um, day in and day out, the biggest questions that are flowing through research are um, anything and everything to do with this advanced child tax credit. So the IRS released most recently three FAQs on this topic that you can see those on the uh, next slide. Um, the first FAQ is regarding shared custody of a child and how the IRS decides who's going to receive the advanced child tax credit payments. The second FAQ, they address parents who are alternating years in which one is claiming the child in one year, the other one is claiming the child in the other year, um, and how is that going to impact the child tax credit and the advanced child tax credit. And the third FAQ deals with possibly the one parent receiving the advanced child tax credit, even though the other parent's going to be claiming them on the upcoming return. So first of all, the advances, the advanced child tax credit payments were based on children claimed on the child tax credit on the 2020 tax return or the 2019 return if the 20 return was not processed at the time of the payment determination was made. So later in the year, the taxpayers could go in, update their 2021 qualifying children information using the child uh, tax credit update portal. Um, but ultimately, Megan, it truly comes down to these parents of the children. They just need to coordinate with each other using the IRS portal. Um, if they do not coordinate and cooperate with one another, they run the risk that somebody or both may end up paying back some of the advanced child tax credit. So as tax professionals, what we should do is be proactive and identify our clients that we know that are in this situation, switching kids from year to year and reach out to them now. And the great thing about this is you know, those of us that have been doing this a while, and you can kind of tell those on this call that have, um, we've been trained, never rely on non-authoritative sources, right? I mean, you always have to have an authoritative source. Uh, one could be substantial change in, in an IRB released uh, about a week and a half ago. The IRS is now saying a taxpayer can rely on the FAQs on the website, um, and if they do, in good faith, do that, that they can avoid negligence penalties and accuracy-related penalties. So, you know, we're not going to change. Those of us that are old dogs, too, too old to learn new tricks, and I'm talking about Bob, and I would never <laughs> um, say that about anyone I didn't know as well as Bob. But, uh, you know, it is, it is the right thing to do because in the age of technology where most of us are getting our information on, on the Internet, the IRS is going to archive FAQs. So if you relied on something on a particular day, it should still be there if the taxpayer did or if you did as a preparer. Um, and you should have the ability to always be able to pull out the 
the FAQ that you relied on when you filed the return or took a particular uh, interpretation, I should say, especially these, I mean, this advanced child tax credit, as Sherry was pointing out, it's two credits. I mean, you have under six and over six and everything revolves around those two credits and whether they were advanced or, I mean, it's, it's a complex process. And so having that FAQ is kind of a safety net is a really good um, thing that the IRS has done, I think. And for some people, it adds another level of complexity maybe to the decision whether to file joint or separate. If someone has gotten those advanced payments, um, the example that the chair was using that, you know, they claim the child every other year and they got the payments, but they're not claiming the child this year. There might be cases where filing separate so that you are under that $40,000 and don't have to pay it back um, is advantageous. So it's, it's just one more piece of complexity to, to throw in there. Yeah, and so it seems like the IRS has covered a lot of topics, as Sherry previously mentioned, from A to O. What, I guess my next question would be for Sherry, what hasn't the IRS really provided a lot of guidance on yet? I think we're waiting on the final guidance on how to reconcile this <clears throat> on the tax return coming up very soon. It's like a big, big ball in the windshield coming at us that we need to know how to do. But, <clears throat> excuse me, there are being very proactive. If you look at the draft schedule 8812, which is formerly the additional child tax credit form, it has now been renamed to credits for qualifying children and other dependents, and it has been completely redesigned. And it looks like this is going to be our vehicle to reconcile all the advanced payments and whether or not anything needs to be paid back. I will confess, I haven't gone through this form line by line. I will wait till it doesn't say draft on it anymore, just because I, that's the way I am, lazy. But um, mm -hmm. that is what the process is starting to look like. It's going to be, this schedule has been totally redone. That will help us. So that's our big thing right now, is how this is actually gonna me mechanically work on the tax returns. So as tax preparers, myself included, we have to figure out how to best make this work. We went through these growing pains with the economic impact payment last year and the recovery worksheets. Once you do one, it's gonna fall into place, but you have to get to that point to be able to do one. And so as long as it says draft on there, there's still wiggle room for change. The drafts, usually they don't, I shouldn't say this because I'll jinx myself. They, they usually don't change that dramatically. Um, well, that's and good. The, the, the thing we're waiting on now is the uh, the line five worksheet where it computes the um, you know the phase out of the credit of the uh, additional credit. Um, we've come up in house with our own version of it so that we can do the computations, so that we can you know we have it mostly working in the uh, version of the software we have, um, not finalized but mostly working. Um, but the, uh, the only piece that, that seems to be missing is that calculating the, uh, the phase out and that's math that we can do. I, I would rather have the official IRS worksheet, but what we've got works. So, <laughs> and the, the good thing is that worksheet Bob's talking about when you get, and this is, I don't know if I can do a quick advertisement for Drake, but when Drake users get you know, the, the early release of our software sometime after Thanksgiving, that worksheet will be in there and you can play around with it because there, I mean, the complexity here is you have two phase outs, right, Bob? I mean, you have a phase out for the additional child tax credit mm -hmm. and you have a phase that is a lower amount, $120,000 or so, I think. I'm looking for you to nod your head, Bob, <laughs> nod your head. Um, and then you have the phase out for the normal child tax credit, the $2,000, uh, which is a much higher for married family joint. I think that's over 300,000, right? So you have, I'm still looking for you to <laughs> nod your head, Bob. So there, there's, uh, uh, there's complexities around um, that phase out calculation that I would, I would recommend all preparers when you do get your software, you become familiar with how that phase out is going to work because it's all refundable. I mean, it, 
there's it's not above the line anymore. It is below the tax line. It is all refundable. Whatever after the phase out, the entire credit is refundable, and it's a big number. I mean, it can be a very large number that needs to be reconciled. And um, the oh, the other piece of that is the due diligence requirements that's going to come along with that. So. So along with the due diligence requirements, um, Rhonda, do you have any insight on what tax pros can look, will need to have or need to ask their um, clients regarding this? Uh, regarding the due diligence, Megan, it's just the documentation. It's um, anything that, as uh, Bob has mentioned, all of us old dogs here, um, the things that we've asked for in the past to substantiate, you know, for the children that they're claiming on the return. So we just want to make sure that, you know, we have, we follow the due diligence that we've always done in the past and don't rely on, you know, maybe I've checked it uh, last year or the prior year and I don't need to do it this year. You just want to make sure that um, you do ask for that documentation and, and copy it and put it in the file. Yeah. And, and that, for that part. Uncle. That part hasn't really changed much. The thing that's going to be kind of a, a curveball is the, uh, and a little off topic, but it's the earned income credit due diligence because of the uh, changes they've made uh, regarding eligibility, uh, particularly for um, taxpayers without a child. But that's another you know, topic for next time. Google discussion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, or using 2019 income, that could be a commercial for the next uh, the next session here because using 2019 income for 2021 for ESE does have additional due diligence requirements potentially. So there's your commercial. <laughs> Great. Yeah, and I know that um, NATPA members do receive a due diligence on-demand webinar that will be available in January. So if you do have questions regarding what your requirements will be from that. Take a look at that. Um, it also sounds like Drake users will get a chance to uh, test out the software and be prepared for this upcoming tax season. So if we have nothing else on the advanced child tax credit, we're going to move on to some quick hot topics. And we're going to start with that Peaton season has officially opened. Rhonda, who needs one and when do they need it by? It definitely has. So Megan, for all of those folks signing a return, you're going to need a P-10. Uh, before you sign a return, you need to get your uh, P-10. So in prior years, um, those of us who've been doing taxes for a lifetime, we've seen this in prior years, you know, there was a fee for the P-10. Then there was not a fee for the P-10. This year, the IRS has a fundraiser and they need some money. So once again, there's a fee for the P-10. So this year it's $35.95. Um, when you're going Going on and renewing the P-10, you want to make sure that all of your contact information is current. Um, you want to be sure to renew before the end of the year, so the sooner the better. Um, and uh, if the tax professional is maybe taking a year off from preparing and signing returns, they want to just confirm that no one else has used their P-10. So once again, fee this year, do it as soon as possible. Great. I think the other big thing that is on the minds of tax professionals is potential legislation that might happen in December. Also the continuing resolution to keep the government open through December expires. There's debt ceiling issues going on that might happen in December. So John, my question for you is how will this impact Drake and tax preparers? Well, um, Number one, late legislation. I would say if we are going to take a vote on this panel, um, you would probably get 100% that would say we are going to have some type of tax legislation before taxes. Um, and it will impact every tax return we do in some way, shape, or form. Now, that's, that's not final. It's not official, but I would say that that will happen. The biggest challenge that that presents, of course, the complexities and having to re-educate ourselves, but it could push out the start of tax season. And what that does is it compresses not only the compression that we feel in our tax practices 
um, where we have to start later, file later, resolve issues later, and we end up, you know, working 30 days when we, we should have been getting all that work done, had 60 days to get it done, is, is ex, ex, um, exponentially worse at the IRS. And, um, you know, if the government doesn't have a, a predictable funding, then obviously the challenges they already have, their number one challenge is staffing. And those challenges lead to processing delays. They lead to more problems for taxpayers. I mean, we had um, on October 16th, there were 7.1 million still unprocessed individual tax returns from this year. Um, there are hundreds of thousands still in errors and resolutions. And the delay in refund, and, and that is not to say the IRS is not doing a stellar job. They are doing a great job but they are under-resourced. And, um, you know, if we add more complexity on top of that, um, it's going to mean taxpayers end up getting their refunds later and potentially have uh, a much more difficult time resolving issues with the IRS. It sounds like there's a lot of work to be done before tax season. Um, I know Drake's known for your amazing customer support. What other kinds of initiatives does Drake have to support tax professionals this upcoming tax season? Well, probably the biggest thing we do is every fall, um, we do uh, what we call our update schools where we train tax professionals. We have folks like Bob that participate, um, Robin Miles, who's been with Drake and in the tax industry for over 40 years, that have a depth of knowledge that is impressive and we do about five hours of tax update. The one unique thing that Drake does in that, it's an eight hour class, um, is we're able to work in the changes in our tax software. So we don't just say what's gonna happen, but we tell you how to make it work in the tool, the Drake tax software. We do that hands-on where we mix tax law changes with software changes. Um, and we believe that we have a high participation rate in those, those training classes that we do. And actually, NATP comes to, to a lot of them. And, uh, you know, we, we do that. No, we don't do the training together, but we do uh, deal with memberships and, and uh, you know, the individuals that, that use both of our, our products here. And, and we love the partnership and the relationship that we have with, with NATP. But that, that's probably our biggest initiative. And we're probably one of the few software companies that actually pull folks um, from our technical staff to hear directly from customers how we can make our software better how we can make it more intuitive, how we can do more automatic calculations to make their life easier. Very cool. And Rhonda, from the NETP side of things, how are we approaching this upcoming tax season? Well, Megan, as you know, we put out the Tax Pro Weekly every Thursday, and we will be uh, featuring this topic throughout tax season, as I'm sure folks are going to want to know the latest and greatest. Um, also on our website, we do uh, we summarize the various tax acts so to make them very understandable for our members to communicate that to their clients. Um, we also are uh, preparing year-end client newsletters for our members to share with their clients regarding the topics that will impact the returns this year. We do special alerts. As soon as we know something from um, our government relations team, we're putting special alerts out to our members. Also, our tax season updates, which are being offered both live and virtually. They just uh, started yesterday live. Um, that has the latest information on this topic and other topics, along with all of our other e-education offerings that we have. Um, we also have an upcoming child tax credit webinar scheduled. And lastly, our amazing research team, which is available out there to answer any of the questions that our members may have about this topic and any other topic. So that's pretty much how we're uh, keeping our members in the know for this upcoming season. Well, great. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. To learn more about Drake Software and how they can make your tax season a little bit easier, please head to drakesoftware.com. To learn about any becoming an NATP member and to receive the timely news alerts that Rhonda spoke about, please visit netptax.com slash explore. And we invite you to leave comments on our Facebook group and on Drake's Facebook page and suggest the topic for our next show. We got a little sneak peek, maybe it'll be the income tax credit. 
See you guys next time. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Megan.